All right, now we're going to take questions. I, I would ask that you please not give speeches and just give questions. Um, uh, go ahead. Uh, please identify yourself when you ask the question. Um, yes, hello. My name is Daniel Leusink. I'm a freelance correspondent with the Dutch Financial Daily at uh, Financiële Dagblad. I've been based in Japan for six years. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Jasko. Uh, you may have been asked this uh, before, but uh, what do you think of the way former Prime Minister Naoto Kan uh, got the accident, the nuclear accident, under control? And to what extent do you think he was a hero? Um. You know, I, I think um, uh, I've had an opportunity to meet with um, Mr. Khan after the accident, and uh, uh, I think he's ta he took a lot of very significant actions uh, during the crisis. Um, you know, I, I think people who work in government, it's their job to take the right actions in a crisis. Um, I don't think that makes you a hero. Um, I think that's your job. Uh, and, and I think he did a lot of things right. Um, you know, when you have a, a crisis like what happened uh, in Japan, uh, it's a very, very difficult situation. Uh, you're faced with tremendous uncertainty. Um, and the more I think I hear about what he did, I think the more uh, people in Japan will value the leadership that he demonstrated. Uh, because there were a number of very significant crises that he, he managed. It was not only the nuclear accident, but it was responding to the humanitarian crisis of a tsunami that had devastated a, a region in Japan. Um, so I, you know, I think the more that people know and learn about what he did, the more that they'll think he did a fine job uh, in, in reacting to the accident. Um, you know, I'm not one to label people's actions, but, um, uh, you know, I certainly... I think he dealt with a lot of challenges, in particular getting information from TEPCO and kind of breaking through, well, I think the term that's been used here is this, the nuclear village. Um, and he had to break that down. And, um, and once he did, and he established some very good methods then for information sharing, uh, he put Minister Hosuno uh, in charge of, uh, of kind of dealing with the immediate um, act accident response, and I think that was a tremendous leadership decision on his part, and it really put in place a formula and a, and a mechanism for information sharing, for decision making, that ultimately brought this situation under control. So uh, I, I, I'm really very impressed with what he did and, um, and, and how he responded in, in a very difficult crisis. Next. Uh, Rudolf Stenhout, European Energy Review. <coughs> Mr. Jesko, um, if I heard you well, you're not talking about uh, outfacing nuclear energy. You see possibilities on the, in, the mid-term range to uh, continue nuclear energy here in Japan, and what, under what condition do you see those conditions in place to make that happen in a responsible way? Well, you know, I, I think ultimately, you know, if I look maybe I'll start at the long range and work back. I, you know, I would, I would say, you know, 100 years from now, um, I would certainly like to see a Japan that doesn't have to deal with nuclear energy challenges. Uh, you know, I, I think given the, the nature of the country, um, this is a technology that poses significant risks. And unless we gen develop a new generation of technologies for nuclear energy that kind of meet this standard that I've talked about, which is the, the elimination, not just the reduction reduction in the risk, but the elimination of the possibility of a severe accident. Um, you know, I, I, I see that as a technology that is just not viable in Japan or really anywhere else in the world. And, and I think nuclear technology is expensive. It poses, you know, these high consequence, low probability uh, hazard challenges, which are, are really unnecessary. You know, when you look at what happened around the Fukushima Daiichi area, it, it's simply unacceptable. You know, this is a technology that was there to generate electricity. Um, and the impacts on the community are just, you know, astounding. I mean, you know, imagine being removed from your home 
for an indefinite period of time. I mean, that is, that is a personal tragedy that I don't think any of us can fully appreciate unless we've had to go through with it. So, you know, the, the only thing that ultimately weighs into the decision is how do you replace that power in the short term? And I think that's where the focus and the energy needs to be right now is coming up with ways to do that without nuclear, if possible. Um, and, you know, I, I hope and I believe that there are ways to do that. Um, and, and I think that's where I would see the Japanese people putting their resources and their energy is on coming up with those technologies if they, if they exist, deploying them, if they don't exist, developing them. Um, and I think the Japanese people have the ability to do that and have shown that as they've dealt with tragedies, you know, over their, over their history. So, um, you know, ideally I think you would not restart any of the reactors. Um, you know, that uh, may not prove practical. Um, if, if any of the reactors are restarted, there needs to be a thorough public debate and a public dialogue to ensure that those decisions have as much buy-in from members of the public as possible. Because if they don't, it's not going to be successful uh, in the short term until you can then ultimately move to, to whatever technologies will replace it in the long term. Oh, wait. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Per Bodner, per Bodner uh, Sweden, photographer for Realpolitika. I wonder, can you uh, elaborate on this technology that is planned to put uh, uh, Fukushima plant on ice. I've been listening to uh, or watching on TV on B interviews on BBC, CNN, with uh, experts in these matters, and they say that was only uh, when it's been tested before in much lower scale, uh, it has only been for temporary use, not as a permanent use. Your ideas about this, please. Thank you. Well, I'll say some. Th or I'll say some things, and if Mr. Tsui wants to comment too. Um, I, I think we just we have to recognize that there is no simple answer to the water problems in, in Japan uh, at, at the Fukushima Daiichi site. Um, but fundamentally, what what has to be done is known. You have to divert the groundwater away from the site so that it doesn't continue to flow through the reactor building, get contaminated, and flow onto the sea. Um, or, if you can't divert it, you have, to, you have to prevent the water from getting to the ocean, getting to the sea. So, you know, there are a number of proposals, um, the ice wall being one. I can't say that I have any particular experience with technology like that. Um, actually, I don't. So, um, you know, I, I can't really say that I can pass judgment on it. My initial expectation is it will be extremely difficult. It will likely have challenges and have limited success um, or, you know, have, have weaknesses and have some degree of failure, uh, I would expect. I mean, almost any system you design and develop does. So, um, you know, I tend to believe that the simplest solutions are often the best. That one seems to be a more complicated solution. Um, so, um, but, you know, I think right now what has to happen is people have to put ideas on the table and those ideas have to be discussed to ultimately come up with the best approach going forward. Um, but there will not be a right answer, just like there was never really a right answer during the accident itself. I mean, very early on there was some technical disagreements between the NRC and the Japanese government about um, what, to what degree uh, several of the reactor buildings should be flooded. Um, there was uh, reasonable concern on the part of the Japanese that flooding those, those um, reactor vessels and reactor buildings would lead to greater leakage in groundwater. Um, the NRC perspective was that you fundamentally had to get the reactors under control to reduce the airborne contamination. So there was no real, there was no right answer in that, cho in that action. There was a choice and you dealt with the consequences. Um, the continued use of water obviously has its consequences and that is the continued outflow from the reactor buildings which is it's mixing with groundwater from, from the hillsides and, and contaminating. So, um, you know, I, I don't think at this point you can just really say one technology is gonna work and one isn't. I think right now you really have to begin exploring every option and, and consider it. But you know, this, it will be new whatever is done and it will likely be challenging and it will not likely work as well as anticipated. Um, Mr. Mr. Tsui has some comments on this as well. Um, Mr. Tsui, could, Mr. Tsui, could you explain your academic background a little bit so that people understand what level of expertise you're, you're, you're coming from? Uh, 
えっと、私はあの、えー、ペトロリアムリファイナリーとかペトロケミカルプランツの、えー、コンストラクションの、えー、エンジニアリングマネージャーとか、えー、プロジェクトマネージャーをやってきましたしたがってその原子力そのものにはあの詳しくはありませんしかしまあ,あの水の問題なんかは特別その原子力であるからという。いう特別な問題でないので、まあ私の意見をグループの中であの議論しております。So my personal background is that I have been working for many years as a construction manager and project manager in、uh, petrochemicals or petroleum refineries and so on, with a background in mechanical engineering. And so in this aspect, while I am not an expert in nuclear energy itself, in terms of the plant construction and so on, and particularly including the issue of water, this is something which is a common issue to the other plants which I have been working in the construction on as well. And so with this background, I am a member of the、uh, Experts Commission working on the citizen side. So, the frozen wall is the same. その私はあの深い知見はありませんがそれがあの、えー、まだ十分に大きな規模で、えー、経験されているということがないのでその点の懸念を、えー、感じております。それで、And In regards to the technology of the frozen wall,、uh, again, similarly, while I don't have personal deep experience in this actual technology itself,、uh, we、uh, harbor concerns in regards to this because of the fact that it has not been tested particularly on the kind of large scale or long term scale that we are talking about for this situation. ね、それ、テンポラリーであるか、あのえー、長くずっと使えるかっていう点についてあの、はっきりしたお答えを申し上げることはできません。And so, in that respect, it is not possible to say at the moment whether this will only be a temporary solution or if it is something that can be considered for the long term, given the current expertise with this. それで、あの本日、えー、ここで申し上げたわた私のプロポーズは、プロポーズは、あのえー、あプローブされたコンベンショナルな技術であの早くそしてあ,の、えー、あまり障害がなくつまり今計画されている場所はあの、えー、建物の近くでいろんな障害があるので時間がかかると聞いておりますのでそういう障害がなく早く。確実に作る方法というつもりで提案を申しました。And the proposal of or the recommendations which I have shared with you today from our commission, the basis for this is rather than using these untested methods but relying on more proven conventional methods which、uh, have been experienced in other cases and which can be implemented faster with less obstacles or challenges to putting forward、uh, or implementing these proposals. For example, we hear that in the current existing plan,、uh, the Talk is about putting this all nearer the buildings, and so there are more obstacles in the construction of this and more challenges which would have to be around. So, the proposal which we are recommending to the government is based on more conventional proven methods in that respect. Martin? Martin Kölling from the German Financial Daily Handelsblatt.、Uh, I have basically one follow up question and then a question regarding the nuclear power plant or the situation in Fukushima.、Um, regarding this frozen wall, I heard that this ice wall also could、uh, work as some are concerned that the ice wall also could work as a neutron reflector and basically increase、uh, the risk of、uh, re- criticality in、uh, the re- reactor cores.、So、have you heard about this、uh, concern and what do you think about it? This is maybe two or three、uh, participants. And、uh, then my other question is、um, about Fukushima.、Um, how, yeah, how big do you think、uh, the regional impact? Of this accident will be in the future. 
will this be still a large scale risk for a wide area or will this um, basically be yeah a local um, yeah a more more or less a local problem thank you very much um I have not heard of the issue of um, of neutron reflection, um, and I I have not I would I, my gut reaction is that that would not necessarily be an issue. I mean, you you have water at the site, um, but I, I so I I would be skeptical that that would be an issue to to be concerned about. But um, but I mean, certainly, I'm sure it's something that should be looked at if, if there is a possibility of, of, of that. But I, I, I would not initially think that that's something that would be of concern. Um, in terms of the overall impact of, of the accident, I mean, that, you know, ultimately, I think it's a question of, it becomes a question of resources. So, in principle, you can clean up and you can decontaminate and decommission everything, you know, essentially back to the reactor buildings predominantly. Um, it simply becomes a question of cost. Uh, you can remediate soil. You can move soil. You can you can uh, you know clean decontaminate buildings. You can um, remove all of this material. Uh, so it just becomes a question of how much cost you you want um, to incur and how much dose you want to incur. Um, and that is a very very difficult question. Uh, um, but that will determine the extent really that this accident um, will have in the future. Uh, and I, I think, um, uh, you know, my expectation would be that, it, you know, it's likely to continue to be somewhat of a, you know, quasi-regional impact for decades uh, to come. And, um, you know, and, and once you disturb a community, it's very difficult to re repopulate a community. Uh, people have moved on. They have to take new jobs and develop and create new communities. Uh, to then say, you know, 10 years from now to people, well, why don't you go back to your home that you had 10 years ago is just not realistic um, because maybe none of their friends will go back and none of the doctors want to go back or none of the, you know, the car dealers want to go back. Uh, you, you can't recreate a community that easily after such a long period of time. So. Um, I think you'll see uh, it will be difficult to recreate those communities that were evacuated um, because of just the longevity of the evacuation. Um, well, one question. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to throw out a question here. What is your assessment, Dr. Yatsuko, of the, the state of the Fukushima re accident? Is it an ongoing crisis? Is it J Japan declared cool shut, cold shutdown in uh, 2011, yet every day they're still pumping water into the ground. And in June, radioactive steam was caught coming from the ground. Is, is it really cold shutdown, or is there still some sort of ongoing nuclear reaction happening? W what would you assess the situ situation at Fukushima right now? Yeah, I, you know, I would say it's an ongoing challenge. Um, it's not an ongoing crisis, and it will be an ongoing challenge for decades. Um, in terms of the reactor safety itself, uh, there does appear to be sufficient cooling. Um, Recriticality does not appear to be a problem or, or uh, an issue of concern. So, um, but that in itself creates problems because the need to continually provide water cooling creates this issue of continually contaminating water. Um, so you 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 create this environmental contamination problem that you're having to deal with on a very significant scale. And you know these the difficult issue is that the immediate crisis is over, but these issues will go on for decades. I mean, there is no solution that makes this go away tomorrow. How, how long will they have to pump water into it to cool it down? Uh, years uh, before they get to a point of being able to air cool. It'll depend to some extent on the fuel configuration, depending on how much, uh, depending on how the fuel has melted, uh, to what extent it can be cooled by air. Um, so th you just won't know these things for long, for years, I mean, to come. I mean, there is no, there just is no uh, simple answer. Um, and uh, that, you know, that is, I think, the difficult issue to confront is that, you know, to some extent with cold shutdown, uh, and I actually came out here in, in December of 2011, 
um, as they reach the cold shutdown phase. And that was a very significant milestone because it, it definitely reduces the, um, uh, the, the concerns from the fuel and the airborne contaminations when you get to, to cold shutdown. Um, but it did not end the ongoing accident to some extent. Um, that really put an end to the crisis, but the accident will continue for decades, really. I'll go back to you, but first, him, him. go ahead. You with your hand raised. The glasses. Yes. My name is Crowell from Nuclear Intelligence Weekly. Would, would you recommend to the Japanese that they set up something similar to the United Kingdom a decommissioning authority to take into hand not only the, the uh, Fukushima units, but the several other uh, units that have already been announced for, slated for decommissioning, uh, Hamaoka 1 and 2, 5 and 6 at Fukushima, some of the plants in uh, Fukui Prefecture that are old and, may, and sitting on possibly active faults. Well, from what I've seen, the, the government has um, engaged more uh, in the direct cleanup activities. Um, you know, ultimately, in my view, TEPCO is the responsible party for this accident, and TEPCO needs to be um, held accountable. And part of that accountability means being responsible for the cleanup activities. Uh, now, I think there needs to be a strong oversight element. Uh, on the part of the regulators and on the part of the government to ensure that they do that in a way that ensures safety. But, you know, my personal philosophy is you, you need to hold accountable, in particular, private sector entities that, that have accidents like this. And, and turning to a government um, corporation to assume the responsibility for cleanup absolves, I think, a private corporation of the responsibility to do that. And, and it's not something that, um, that I, I think, um, you know, would would, would, would you know, be consistent with that principle. But clearly, TEPCO has had challenges. Clearly, there needs to be significant oversight of the work that they do so that ultimately, public health and safety is assured. And um, if in the end, it's determined that TEPCO cannot be, then there may need to be a new, a new entity to take over specifically those decommissioning activities. Yes, Per Bordner again, Real Politica. Uh, I wonder what was your, what is your reaction to Mr. Abbe's talks about everything is all right, every no problem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and the question is for the three of you. Uh, え、非常にあの、I believe this is a, a very wrong expression. <laughs> well, look, I mean, the, the, you know, the, um yeah, there, there's no, I mean, in the context, of, you know, a lot of these statements were made in the context of the Tokyo Olympics. I mean, there's no, there's no immediate impact from the contamination issues at, at the Fukushima Daiichi plant on Tokyo. Um, you know, it is an ongoing challenge. It, it is, um, uh, you know, it is to some extent, what was unleashed was a force beyond human control. Um, the, what you can do is try and mitigate that. But you can't really control it. I mean, you, you cannot control groundwater. You can try and do things to mitigate the impact of that groundwater on the site. But whatever, whether it's an ice well, whether it's, it's Mr. Tsutsui's proposal, whatever system you build is going, groundwater will find a way around it and into it and affect it. Uh, you know, if you, and if you have homes, you probably have had leaks in your homes. I mean, you, water is, is a, a terribly potent entity in that regard. So, you know, to talk about control or not control, you know, I think these are words and, and terms, um, but clearly there are ongoing challenges. Clearly there needs to be continuous monitoring. And I think the good thing about some of these leaks is it's re-engaged awareness on the issues so that attention and focus will be back on this activity. And, and it's hard to stay focused on something like this for decades, but that's what's needed. Um, you know, the, there's 
very risk significant activities happening in the next several months with move, uh, the attempts to remove fuel from the Unit 4 spent fuel pool. That's a very significant activity and is also unprecedented. Um, there's significant structural damage to the Unit 4 spent fuel pool. New structures had to be created. They're going to have to lift significant degree, debris from the, the pools. Uh, these are all very, very unprecedented activities. Um, so there will be challenges with that activity, I'm sure. Uh, and so there needs to be a lot of focus. There needs to be a lot of conservatisms. People need to think about these things with safety first and foremost in mind uh, and, and take, you know, these activities slowly. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, I don't think that there's any impact certainly on Tokyo, um, but, uh, you know, there, there, is, there is need for greater oversight for sure at the site. Um, pray you probably said that better than I did. <laughs> okay. Um, the gentleman, gentleman, the gentleman in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the Masa Ota uh, with Japanese Wire Service Kyoto News. Dr. Jasko, I would like to ask you a view on the uh, nuclear waste disposal problem in this country. You have your own problem in your backyard. And the, uh, we have in Japan 40 metric tons of separated plutonium already, but the uh, ongoing process of the uh, nuclear power plant is going to be accumulating more plutonium in the future. Would you uh, have any uh, good prescription for Japanese public and the Japanese government to deal with the, uh, this nuclear waste problem of this country? Uh, maybe a temporary storage or direct disposal would be a good option for the future? I would like to. I mean, uh, Oh, temporary storage or direct disposal. Yeah. Could you make any comment on that? Thank you very much. Well, I think um, with th – there's two issues. One, you have the spent fuel issue and the management of the spent fuel, which generally can be done safely um, uh, for you know, periods of at least 100 years or so um, with active management and strong oversight. Uh, the separated plutonium is a different issue, and that needs to be protected not only from a safety perspective, but perhaps more importantly from a security perspective um, because of the, the concerns that that material poses um, for use in, in nuclear weapons. Uh, that is a very significant issue, uh, and I think going forward it's certainly, uh, in particular, if, if the reactor program is going to shut down, obviously um, there's very little reason to continue to separate plutonium and reproduce MOX fuel. Um, and given the uncertainty right now with the reactor program, uh, you know, I, I would think that it's prudent to, to re-examine uh, the, the need for the separation, uh, you know, going forward. Um, we have time for about two more questions because these gentlemen have to catch her, capture an airplane. May I see some hands from people who have not asked questions, who would like to ask questions? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to ask questions. <laughs> I just, want, I just want to respond to your question. There, there, there's two ways to look at the problem. The, the, the problem within the facility is one question, but then there's the answer to the surrounding communities and no, their, their reality is, is not okay and it hasn't been resolved. So it depends on how you frame this problem. And I think that was the point of coming here was to expand the definition of the problem there, there are communities that are permanently impacted. There are people still living in areas that are radiologically considered hot zones, uh, children living there. And I think, I think those are the issues when, when a comment, broad generalization that everything's fine, um, it, it's, it's perhaps uh, an insult to the people that are confronting this reality and are, are, are generally now ignored. Um. No speeches, please. It's just a question. Uh, my name is Maria Muguchi with AP. Um, I would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Yasko a, a question re related to the contaminated water situation. Um, you mentioned a little bit uh, earlier um, that there was some dis discussion how much um, water should be put into the reactors uh, at the very beginning between the U.S. and Japan. Um, was was there a clear um, awareness of the um, situation like this happening right now on both sides 
and uh, uh, was there discussion about how it should have been or should be handled at the beginning? Um, how do you evaluate the situation or the, the handling um, taken by the Japanese side uh, this time? Thank well, you. yeah, the short answer is yes. I mean, this was known from the beginning that there would uh, potentially be these contamination problems. I mean, and until large volumes of water were put into the reactor buildings to essentially ultimately cool the reactors, um, it wasn't known the extent of the leakage that would, would develop from that, but it was always um, – it was a possibility that was considered. Uh, and. Um, uh, there were early plans to um, drive uh, the, these metal plates uh, in, into the um, ground to kind of form a seawall to prevent um, groundwater migration. I believe those plans were never implemented because of inability to properly put those plates in without causing other damage. So, um, you know, it, this, it, it's been known for a long time that this would be an issue. Uh, what the, the, my biggest surprise is to some extent how how it's been allowed to um, deteriorate a little bit and how um, how it's almost become a surprise again that there that there are contamination problems that there is leakage out to the sea uh, so that's really the bigger concern in my mind is how the focus was lost on the need to continue to to address this groundwater contamination problem Thanks, sir. I'm Rick Weisbert. I have a scientific editing and translation service. So it's clear that vested interests have a very big voice in decision making about these kinds of issues. And uh, even in the United States and Japan, it's, uh, it's difficult to come to consensus about what to do. At the same time, we have major export of nuclear technology and build out of nuclear energy in a lot of countries that have much less of a democratic tradition. Uh, can you say anything about uh, what the future looks like in uh, countries where there may be more authoritarian control over decisions about energy and the, 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 the consequences of building out nuclear energy in such societies? Thank you. From my personal experience in the United States, from a citizen's perspective, it was very hard to have a say in any of the decisions about something as simple as the decommissioning of a power plant that would basically reach its, the end of its useful life. The other issue that you just mentioned is, 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 is a much larger issue. You're talking about proliferation of, of uh, certain materials, uh, plutonium and so forth. That's a, that's a much larger question, perhaps, one of the reasons why I'm here, I have three small children. I, I, I would like to see us all here in this room open up this dialogue much wider. So my kids aren't addressing this issue uh, 25 years from now. And I think it's a, it's, this is the larger public discussion that I think a number of people in Japan want to have right now. It's a turning, turning point. Uh, this, this energy paradigm shift has with it also a, weapons component to it, which is a bigger discussion beyond myself and uh, the public, but the public needs to be at the seat, absolutely. I, I don't think the public wants to see this technology proliferate in a way that we lose control of this material by winding up in the hands of uh, unstable governments. That's a, that's a, that's a, this is the kind of discussion that the Japanese have asked to expand on here. The Japanese public has, have asked to expand on and be part of. They don't want to see these decisions be made unilaterally by an industry that's excluding the public from those discussions. Um, uh, normally we would take more questions, but these gentlemen have to get to the airport. Um, I'd like to thank all three of them for coming today. And from the FCCJ, um, here is an honorary membership. Come back to Japan anytime and feast on the delicious <coughs> sesame-free uh, fish and chips we have here in the bar. Um, and thank you for coming today. And let's give them a round of applause.